the panel game that wanders around culture's lavish gallery muttering things like, ooh, a child could have painted that, and ooh, look, they've gone over the edges. Our two captains are a comedian who's gone from a light lunch to supersizing, it's Sue Perkins, and a comedian who's gone from an ape that got lucky to a lab rat, Chris Addison. Sue's guest is a comedian who on May the 17th last year released a DVD of his stand-up show, Someone Likes Yogurt. Uh, although it was removed from the shelves by May the 30th, and sadly it was past itself by date. Uh, it's Richard Herring. Chris's guest is a literary academic who is that rarest of Australians, a literary academic. It's Professor Jermaine Greer. Right, first round is three steps to heaven. Teams are shown three images, each a clue to a film, book, play, or musical. Three generous points are awarded uh, if they can guess the answer from the devilish first picture, plunging into a single point for the stunningly simple third clue. So Sue and Richard, you're going to start. Well, another satisfied Pizza Hut customer there. <laughs> So she's trying to drink from a well. She's either got a very long neck or a very long tongue. Either way, I'd quite like to meet her. <laughs> I think we probably need another photo there. I'm going to guess. Uh, here is uh, a number of waiters, and I can tell you it's in a Baghdad restaurant. Uh, but the clue here is is a waiter. Okay. Uh, so let's have a look at the two pictures together. Waiting for God. Is it Will's Kitchen? <laughs> It is absolutely right. But how right. the hell are we going to do it? The answer is Samuel Beckett's landmark play, Waiting for Godot. Now, I think we have to have a, a little look at the clues. Uh, one character in the play is called Pozzo, which, as linguists will tell you, is Italian for no. Oh, I that, can't believe course. it, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, the employees of the Baghdad restaurant earn their living by waiting. <laughs> Let's have a look at the third photo. Here is Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin giving uh, what, what for to a couple, couple of young dissidents, dissidents, I think. Uh, <laughs> Vladimir is one of the place's two time killing main characters. characters. Uh, so, two points there to Sue and Richard. Play is all about two men <laughs> hanging around waiting for Godot to arrive. They wait for one day, then another, but still nothing. And then, sure enough, three Godots turn up all at once. <laughs> so, over to Chris and Jermaine. Here is the first of your pictures. Oh. Any ideas? Is it uh, the Amy Winehouse story? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to see another photograph? There's Yuri Geller, a man who could solve world hunger and cure cancer, but will still always be known as a spoon earner. And the clue here, I can tell you, is his supposed telepathic powers. Okay, It's a book that has got the telepathic powers are very important. I don't think I've ever read a book in which... Uh, let's put the two together. Let's put the first two together. All right. What's, what's the bit that when you... Well, look at that bit that... The, the nose. nose. No. The no, nose. not so. <laughs> the nose. The nose. The nose. 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 nose is very good. Okay. okay. So the nose is very good, and the telepathic, the telepathic thing is very good. That is true. Have a look at this final visual, visual clue. Uh, oh. This is uh, purveyor of the fish dish, somewhat oddly known as Bombay duck. duck. Okay. okay. The clue, however, is Bombay. Midnight, Midnight children. It absolutely is. Oh. Oh yeah. There was a novel called The Corksucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is Midnight Children, the Booker Prize winning 1981 novel by Salman Rushdie, recently voted the Booker of All Bookers, and the story's narrator Salim Sanai is known by the nickname The Nose. He tells of the events after India's independence by his quest to reunite the children of the title, all of whom are imbued with telepathic powers, and Bombay, now known as Mumbai, is where the narrator is born. Uh, so you get one point. Well done. Uh, I've been, been forbidden by him, the champion of free speech, ever to speak about him again. Is that right? Absolutely. Did you like the book? 
Uh, mm, no. <laughs> I've never, never said, said that before. It oh. just popped out of my mouth. It's, it's very hard. Uh, well, I dislike the book intensely because it is the only post-colonial novel. Mm. And all students who want to do post-colonial literature end up having to do Midnight's Children. And I never, I can't understand the category. I say, I'm Australian. Is our literature colonial or post-colonial? Where does the post bit come from, especially when you're writing in the language of the coloniser? I tried to read it. I just thought it was dull. Yes, I go with dull. And I have read it. But um, I, I don't know, know if, if you talk about him, well, he'll put a mandrake root on your pillow and you'll grow seven years or something. No, he'll just do Herzl mine and remind me that, you know, the fatwa cost him a marriage or two or three. I forget how many have gone under the chopper since then. And um, that's I wish I had a fatwa on me. Yeah, yeah it's convenient very way. Even <laughs> explaining why I failed to keep a girlfriend. I love you. It's, it's not fatwa. It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's the bounty on my head. Uh, well, apparently the book took five years to write. And, and four to read. read. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the book's focal point is midnight, August the 15th, 1947, which saw the partition of India and the formation of Pakistan, an historic moment in the 20th century, as it created yet another team to thrash England cricket. <laughs> uh, so I can tell you, at the end of that round, Chris and Jermaine have got one point, but in the lead are Sue and Richard with two. <laughs> The second round is called Yes and I'm Mickey Mouse. The teams meet members of the public who share their names with characters from literature, film or song before trying to identify them via questions to which the answer can only be yes or no. And teams have got 90 seconds to cross-examine each mystery guest, after which they must take a guess at his or her identity. So Sue and Richard, let's meet your fictional namesake. For the audience only, here is the fictional character with whom she shares her name. Oh, this was an interesting moment to see whether there's any reaction. Some nodding. A bit of nodding. Is it all? Soon, Richard, your minute and a half begins now. Is it a contemporary book? No. Was it written in the 19th century? Um, yes. Okay. So, is it. Uh, can I have your phone number? <laughs> <laughs> say no, say no. Yes. Well, yes! <laughs> Is it American? No. Is it Scandinavian? No. Is it, um, uh, British? Is it British? Yes. <laughs> Richard got one, yes. Is it a woman? woman? Yes. It is a woman. Are you, are you a hero book? Yes. yes. Okay. But it's right for a genre. Romantic? Yeah. 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 Are you written by George Eliot? No. Uh, Jane Austen? No. Oh, uh, God. Um, Mary Shelley? No. Yes, it's Frankenstein, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have a romantic liaison? Yes. Oh, yes. Are you Kathy from Wuthering Heights? I'm sure! Yes! Oh, it took us a while. Oh, we've got a date. <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, yes, our mystery guest actually shares her name with Catherine Anshaw, Emily Bronte's windswept leading lady from Wuthering Heights. So two points to Sue and Richard. Think it through. And the name was Earnshaw already. So did they think? Yeah, that was named after the character. You were. Oh, yeah. So you made to read the book early on. Mm -hmm. I read it when I was fifteen. And did, did you like it? I loved it when I was fifteen, and I reread it recently. And I just thought, get a grip. When you're a teenager and you lock yourself out, <laughs> Mum, it's me, it's Gary. <laughs> 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 Ellis Bell. And it's common in English literature for female writers to use male pseudonyms. For instance, I tend to use Ian McEwan. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Bronte's two elder sisters died in childhood, then her brother Bramwell, Anne and Emily herself all died within a year of each other, yet strangely, uh, no one ever questioned Charlotte about all those life insurance policies. <laughs> Chris Ray, let's meet your fictional namesake. Hey. Right, welcome to our second mystery guest, and for the audience only, here is the character from film with whom she shares her name. Oh, <laughs> oh is that oh, oh, yeah. oh, Yes, it's Bambi. Oh. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, Chris and Jermaine, your 90 seconds starts now. Uh, so is it a, an American film? Yes. All right, is it a recent American film? No. Are you Mary Poppins? No. No. Oh. Can Richard have your phone number? <laughs> 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 I can touch this one. <laughs> Is your name the title of the film? No. Are you, are you the main character? Yes. Uh, is it a black and white film? It, at the beginning. Oh! oh. 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 Are you a scarecrow? Are you a lion? Are you made of tin? Are you a small dog? Are you a witch? We need the whole name. Uh, Dorothy Earnshaw. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy, Dorothy... It's to do with... Dorothy Hurricane. Dorothy Wind, <laughs> Dorothy Twister, Dorothy, Dorothy Storm, Tornado, Cyclone, Dorothy Michael Fish, uh, <laughs> Dorothy Blower, Dorothy Blower. Dorothy Blower. <laughs> this has gone way beyond the yes, no round. To hell. <laughs> oh, oh, that's that's it. hand over to the side. Oh, well, I'm guessing it's Dorothy Gale. It is Dorothy Gale. Gale. Yes, this lady shares her name with Dorothy Gale, the heroine from my favourite film, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, we would have got the scarecrow, but Boris Johnson pulled out of the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Were you born, Dorothy Gale? No. What, 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 no, don't, don't say yes or no to me. No. How <laughs> no, uh, am I? Did you see the film when it, when it first came out? Yes. What did you think of it? Did you it was brilliant. Yeah, are, you, are you still fond of it? Yes, very I, much. I love it, absolutely. Absolutely. Love it, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And, and where have you come? You've come quite a long way to be with us today. From Bansley. Yeah. Oh, and, oh, South Yorkshire. And do people still remember the film? Do they still say, oh, I Bansley? believe so. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, there are quite a lot that were really interested when they knew I were coming. That's great. <laughs> yeah. well, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Dorothy Gay! Yeah. 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 Well, I've gone back to Kansas. There we are. I'm going to award uh, Chris Rain one point because you got uh, you got the Dorothy oh. part, but I'm going to give a spare point uh, to Richard for getting the game. Dorothy lives with her uncle and aunt, and in the modern remake, they are forced to leave their Kansas home and settle in a farmhouse on the outskirts of the Emerald City. But sadly, they then buy a subprime mortgage and inadvertently bring down the land of Oz economy. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you that at the end of that round, Chris and Jermaine have got two points, but in the lead are Sue and Richard with five. Oh. <laughs> uh, before we disappear in a cyclone of our own making, here's a little teaser for you at home. Which child star did MGM Studios originally want to cast as Dorothy Gale in The Wizard of Oz? We'll see you after the break. <laughs> Before the break, I asked you which child star did MGM Studios originally want to cast as Dorothy Gale in The Wizard of Oz? Anybody know? Well, it's either Mickey Rooney or Shirley Temple, I would guess. Uh, Shirley, Shirley Temple, Temple. absolutely yeah. right. Oh, very good, very good. Next up, it's Love It or Loathe It. Our guests are invited to choose a subject or genre from the arts which either elevates them to untold heights or enshrouds them in a dark cloud of despair. However, they must attempt to both love and loathe it. The opposing team then deciding which opinion is true. So, Richard, you are in the dock, first of all. Okay. You need to choose a work to choose love and loathe. What have you chosen? I've chosen the, uh, the Angel of the North. Angel of the North. Okay, let's so have a quick look. And are you going to start by loving or loathing? I, I love it. It's a truly populist piece of art. Um, I love uh, when you're driving up the motorway, you get to Newcastle. It's kind of exciting landmarks to see there, kind of looming over the motorway like it's kind of interactivity you can the people put foot, the big newcastle united football shirt on it it's hilarious but it's kind of nice that, that people could interact with it the people of newcastle have taken it to heart and and love it there even though there was some resistance to it to begin with um when I mean, you get close to it it's a very imposing incredible thing to get close to it's just there's something just really beautiful and exciting about it got it made a million pounds on uh antiques roadshow just a tiny copy of it imagine how much that big one must be worth <laughs> so <laughs> when in newcastle's cut it down and turn it into scrap metal that sounds like love to me. Any questions to question his love for it? Who made it? Um, I, I, I don't know his name. Anthony Gormley is well, his I name. Well, I was going to say Anthony Gormley. He's the bloke who did the same one on the... Yeah, but the who actually built it? 
Solo the Newcastle blokes got together. The <laughs> ship workers <laughs> from the extinct shipping industry, shipbuilding industry. This uh, is like intellectual capital. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think it's possible, possible to love something without uh, knowing anything, anything about it. No, no. 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 Anyway, yeah. so that's the uh, that's the basis of a good relationship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I would uh, ask you, please, to loathe the Angel of the North. I hate the Angel of the North. Obviously, it's disgusting. It's a patronising attempt to kind of engage people in art. It's ugly. It's rusty. You get up close. It's just, just covered in graffiti. It, it isn't, isn't like an angel. An angel has proper wings. That's like an, an, an aeroplane. And, and it made a million pounds on the Antiques Roadshow just for a little copy of it. What's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, any more questions? All his work that he has made for s specific sites has a tremendous relationship with the place. And th that's what's fantastic so, to me so, about so, this. If the yeah. shipbuilders hadn't liked it and hadn't wanted to work on it, it would never have been built. <laughs> this is not about whether you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I love it. I, I, guess, guess, I just don't think there's any substance in his okay. carping so, at so, this beautiful thing. So, are you, where are you going, you two? Are you going to say that he loves it or that he loathes it? It's I think he. I think he loves it. Love, all right, loves right, it. Yeah. Richard, do you love or loathe the Angel of the North? Oh, why did he say yeah! that? Yeah! <laughs> How can anyone hate the Angel of the North? I hate it! <laughs> uh, well, the Angel is a symbol of the North East, standing outdoors, exposed to freezing winds of over 100 miles per hour, and still never wearing a coat. <laughs> uh, so you get to two points there, Chris and Jermaine. Well done. Yes. Professor Jermaine Greer, Jermaine, what, what have you chosen? Uh, the work of Bob Dylan. And which, which are you going to start with? Loathe. Okay, so let us go ahead and loathe Bob Dylan. Well, that guy was so desperate to be famous, and he was loved by Joan Baez, whom he used to build his own career. When she first went on stage with him, her audiences booed him to get him off. <laughs> but he was completely single-minded, uh, and the thing he was single-minded about was not the civil rights movement, for whom his songs became anthems, even though when people actually look at the words of those songs, they'll see that they have nothing whatever to do with civil rights. Uh, he got very irritated with people commandeering him and manipulating him, but at the same time, he didn't seem to realize how much he was doing the manipulating. He signed on with the greediest agent in New York, who was Albert Grossman, who took 25% off the top of everything that he earned, but who drove the hardest bargain, and he stayed with him for many years. Can I just say, Richard, this is the kind of detail that we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Uh, well, yes, but, but, but I feel odd questioning Jermaine Greer. It's factually correct that he, he suppressed the career of Joan Baez. He, he, he belittled her, he... That is true? I didn't say that he belittled her. He used her, and then when she'd done what she could for him, he left her. So she used not, her. She's not the only person of whom this was the case. He was particularly furtive about his relationships. He wouldn't acknowledge them publicly. Didn't even acknowledge his wife publicly when he, after he married her. It was supposed to be kept some sort of a dumb secret. Um, yeah, I'm just checking because so if, if, you, if it turns out you love. Bob Dylan, I can say, ah, but you know he oppressed his women. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's let's move on to that. Uh, that. <laughs> Please do not love Bob Dylan. Anybody of my generation has to love Bob Dylan because the sound of Bob Dylan is the sound of the happiest years of our lives. When we really thought that we could change the world. And the great thing about him was that extraordinary sandpaper voice, that nasal delivery, that way of punching out a song that completely lifted it out of the rock of the usual dopey sentimentality that afflicted pop songs of the time. Well, at last was something you could say, this is is our voice. This is what we sound like. And for me, the keynote was his antenna for hypocrisy. And he could seek it out anywhere, in any kind of movement. And he would put it into words. You know, he turned on a whole generation to poetry, to uh, a certain kind of expression of feeling that was at once bitter and sardonic and sometimes absolutely luminous. He could write more beautifully about love than was imaginable. 
partly because he avoided the cliches and he could also write about disappointment and bitterness and do I have to go no, on? No, no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous, sir. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't know what to think anymore. I think you love him. What do you think? I really hate him, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think let's go for love. I think he might have been a clever. clever but what do you say? Name? If you love him, you love a woman hater. <laughs> <laughs> And I got a professor Jermaine Greer who said he hated women. Jermaine, we are we are all going for love with you. Reveal to us now. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Dylan apparently took his name from the poet Dylan Thomas, following the lead of a lesser known folk singer Frank Elizabeth Barrett Browning. <laughs> <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> that is just <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, at the end of that round, Sue and Richard have got five points, but sneaking into the lead are Chris and Jermaine with six. <laughs> Uh, leading, we finish with losing the plot. In the final round, team captains must communicate the plot of a work of literature, film or song to their guests with no mention of names or places nor any allusions to the title. So Chris and Jermaine are in the lead, so they get to start. Here is Jermaine, can I get you to pass this envelope, please? Okay, Chris, your 90 seconds. Oh, no, I have to look. Start <laughs> now. Uh, oh, you wrote it. <laughs> uh, yeah, first one book, you wrote it, very famous. The Female Eunuch. Yes! <laughs> well, well, I think this is your favourite film. It's a uh, film by a famous Italian director, a whole number, an integer and a half. Fraction. That's the one. Uh, more integers and fractions here, but this time uh, it's a sex uh, diary. It's slightly over two months. The 120 Days of Sodom. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about sort of seven day periods, uh, again an integer and a fraction. Well, four and a half weeks, I don't yeah, know. Six and a half weeks, yeah, eight yeah, and a half weeks, yeah, nine and a half weeks. That's it, yes! <laughs> <laughs> this is a, 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 an Aboriginal complaint. He's waved the thing all over the place. He's practiced and he was black in the face. He's a big disgrace to the Aboriginal race, but. Yeah, my boomerang won't come. That's right! <laughs> a uh, small child is taken on by a wolf pack and then has to go out into a large wooded area where he meets <laughs> a tiger, a bear who has a thing about prickly pears, uh, a uh, big. The jungle book. That's the one, yeah. Um, this is about. Oh, well done! Fantastic. I loved it when you said 120 weeks of Sodom and you said, I'll take that. I thought, we're going to sit comfortably for the it's weekend. Not really uh, it to now, I'm, I make it that, uh, that you actually got four correct because eight and a half oh. you said Italy, uh, which is the place name, which you're not allowed to say. So, four points yeah. to, uh, to Chris and Jermaine. <laughs> That means you need six correct ones in order to be oh, the it. victors. You and your 90 seconds starts now. Funniest film ever made about a rock band. This is Spinal Tap. Uh, a famous uh, neurotic uh, director from Woody across Allen. the pond. Uh, there's an orgasmatron. A sleeper. And uh, this is a musical about broads and blokes. Uh, guys and dolls. Uh, <laughs> oh, the worst rom com of all time. She's a prostitute. No, she's not really. Of course, she's a bit more glamorous than that. She's an escort. Yes. Um, uh, fantastic. Uh, I think Booker Prize uh, winning oh, um, yeah. book and also a <laughs> film um, about fu future dystopia um, about women. Um, uh, oh, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, yeah, the hand Handmaid's Tale. Indeed, it is this is you an need one more. piece of theatre where lots of women talk Mamma about mia. about their own genitalia. Oh, the vagina um, monologues. Um, this is a parallel universes where you get into a train and two things can happen. Um, oh, sliding doors. Um, yes, um, I have got a whip. And I'm just uh, I'm constantly Sound moving music. around. I'm constantly no, none, comedy. The, no, none's on the run. And um, I, uh, oh, there's a chalice. It's an incredibly sacred chalice. The um, Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Yes. Um, oh, look, there's a well. And Moby Dick. Um, uh, a well, not a whale. A, whale, a well. Um, and uh, waiting for God, uh, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to um, look into a mirror. And uh, oh, there's a rabbit. Beauty. And uh, there's oh, no, a whale. Alice in Wonderland. And um, yeah. then I'm going to look into the mirror again. I'm the same girl. And Alice through the list. Yes. The, um, <laughs> the, the same object that's reflective. Um, Something's got a little. Um, oh. Wow, fantastic! Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Like well, you got an amazing uh, 10 correct there, so at the end of all that, our condolences to noble failures, Chris and Jermaine, who finish on 10 points. I uh, mean, this week's heroic victors are Sue and Richard with 15. <laughs> This has been What the Dickens, I've been Sandy Toxvig, and I'm off now to my local library. Uh, well, that's what it used to be. It's now a gym with a Starbucks. I'll see you there. Good night. <laughs>